it's my privilege today to get to introduce to you um, our speaker, our presenter for today, and that's Dr. Lisa Giebel. Um, Lisa, I've known Lisa for many years. We have done ministry together back in the day when I was serving in the Northwest, but Lisa has been involved in youth and uh, family ministries for over three decades, and Dr. Giebel started her career by taking at-risk youth into the outdoors for them to experience nature's life-changing abilities. Uh, and these outdoors experiences included rock climbing, spelunking, rafting, hiking, camping, you know, the kinds of things we do at camp, uh, as well as in Pathfinders. Uh, Dr. Giebel has always been passionate about working with youth, and part of her ministry has involved running grief camps for kids in local summer camps, along with providing support for camp staff and other campers and tra uh, and other campers with training. Um, Dr. Giebel has been part of, for a number of years, um, a ministry out of Big Lake Youth Camp called Abba's Child, which is specifically a grief support camp for kids. And uh, if you have questions about that, she's one that you would want to ask questions about. It's just a really a rich uh, ministry that's been going on there for many years. Currently, Dr. Giebel is teaching the Masters of Social Work program at the Wall at Walla Walla Universities. She's involved in the International Red Cross and has responded to multiple natural disasters as well. Um, she's gone on many mission trips and provided one of, uh, one of support and training for orphanages in Mexico, a hospital in Ebi, Micronesia, and family homes and churches uh, in Latvia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Giebel um, counts herself blessed to have walked through some of life's hardest challenges with hundreds of families. She believes and has experienced firsthand that God gives special comfort to the comforters. And Lisa believes in wellness and healing and shares her ministry with anyone she comes in contact with. And so I want to just uh, welcome you, uh, Dr. Giebel, to AACP Connect today and turn it over to you and allow you to uh, share with us out of your heart today. But before we do that, I want to open up with prayer and then it'll be, uh, uh, Dr. Giebel, it'll be all yours. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blessings today and that we have the opportunity to come together and to listen and learn and connect. We ask for your blessing now as Dr. Giebel presents. We ask you, Jesus, to draw close to her, inspire her with vision and wisdom from on high. And Lord, as she speaks, may we hear your voice speaking into our hearts saying, this is the way, walk in it. And so, Lord Jesus, we're looking to you for your blessings and just guide and direct our time together this afternoon. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you guys and share. Um, I live in Walla Walla. I'm a trauma therapist here, and I love what I do. I have an amazing husband and um, lots of animals um, on our farm, and we have a lot of kids come through here, of course, with COVID. That's changed, but I just feel really blessed to be able to be here in this time in this space with you. And what a blessing, you know, as um, Pastor Tracy said, he's asked me to come and talk about mental health for camp staff and campers and um, for all of us when we're working with camps and you're in the trenches. You know, there are five common, um, commonly cited ways to achieve well-being in general and, you know, connecting with people around you. And I'm going to take these off because I think, can you guys hear me okay without these? Yeah. Perfect, because I have to move around. I can't just sit in one spot. I'm a mover. Okay, so um, connecting with people around you, staying active, having quiet time with God in nature and prayer, and always to keep learning. Also being generous and helping others. These are really important things. And what's been hard is due to COVID, a lot of those things haven't happened and they've been disrupted this year. And so how do we, you know, we know that, um, the healthier we are, the more impact we're going to have on kids. And right now, you know, kids are going to be coming to camp, but they're going to have some special needs because they have pretty much been isolated. And so being prepared for that. So we have to have our staff being as healthy as can be. And one of the things I'm always telling my um, people that I work with, clients and people, is to be healthy, we need to... Um, Healthy families need to be able to talk about anything, feel, and listen to each other. And so it's really important for us to be able to provide that in a camp environment. 
Why? Because that's how trust is built and where teamwork takes place and lives are changed. You know, when we create opportunities to connect and really listen to people and there's a comfort there, you know, then growth can happen. You know, every single staff member that comes to camp is going to have their story. And sometimes their stories might be really hard, uh, might be difficult, beautiful and crazy. You know, we just don't know what they've been going through. So with that, um, each staff member's story, you know, they might have some mental health issues. They might have, you know, but the goal is for us to have well-being all together. Um, those stories made have made them who they are. But the, the good thing about camp is those stories are going to be changing because when you get together and you're in a summer camp, you grow and you change and camp moves you to changing, to being a better person and to being, you know, amazing. Um, what well, I've been a camp mom and I love, you know, everything about camp. It just is so good for um, our soul. Um, one of the things that as, as leaders, you know, believing in them, encouraging them, giving people an opportunity to connect with each other, mentoring them, and also giving them an opportunity to share their story. Because when people share their story, it's such a good ministry because we can learn from them. And then it's also they're bearing their burdens and we bear our burdens together. There's a connection. You're listening, you're growing, and it's a really good thing. Um, you know, as, as Adventists and as believers, we know that our goal in camp is to really teach people about Jesus and about the fruits of the Spirit and, you know, to show that love. And my question to you is, do we want them to come to camp and leave with a light, or do we want them to leave with a torch? I am saying for this year, let's go for torch. <laughs> let's really be able to, you know, have people feel the comfort and the love, but also feel Jesus and be able to share that fruit, the fruits of the spirit. I mean, that torch is what I'm going for. So um, one of the things I would always teach my own kids and kids I interacted with is, you know what, you are children of the king. And with that comes this amazing gift and this responsibility and this hope. And so when something bad happens, I'm like, you know what, you're a daughter of the king. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. And that encouragement that goes along with that is, is something that's really beautiful. Um, so one of the things that helps is when camp first starts is to front load things with your staff. Things that you can front load is, you know what, I want it to be a safe place. And I want you to be able to talk about things like I mentioned. And um, also the modeling that you give them on how you handle conflict and how to be supportive in conflict. Sometimes it's just a matter of you, you notice a staff member is upset and you give them permission to say, you know what, I'm really upset today or I'm angry. What we find is anxiety drops the minute they say, I am. You know, and so being able to give them opportunity to express their feelings and release them. So even actually in staff training, you know, saying, if you guys have stuff going on, please talk about it. Let's support each other. We're in this together. This is a beautiful mission. And we want to, you know, walk through this, this path this time together. The other thing I really encourage is no secrets. Um, I say that because um, one of the things that can happen in camp is like someone might go to a counselor and say, you know what, I'm feeling suicidal or I'm feeling like this. We have a zero in our family. We had a zero um, secret policy. Yeah, the present, that can be a secret. But what really helped my family and has helped people that I've interacted with and that I've taught is, for example, my daughter was at school and someone came to her and said, Mom, you know, that they were sexually assaulted. My daughter would say, even though they would say, keep that a secret, my daughter said, you know what? I don't keep secrets like that. I go and get you help. Uh, come with me. We'll go get you help. So then my daughter didn't have to carry those secrets or that staff member doesn't have to carry that secret. They will take that secret to the appropriate person to get them help. We don't keep secrets about touching. You know, we don't keep um, secrets about safety and we don't keep secrets about, you know, eating, like if there's eating disorder stuff, we have to or pornography, you know, we need to, as a team, if there's something going on, if you hear about it, say, you know what, we're going to get you help. Doesn't mean we're going to spread it. It means we're going to get you to the appropriate people. Okay. Does that make sense? It's really important to have that in, in uh, camp just to keep everybody safe. Um, let's see. Got to turn my page. 
that's why it also is important to be able to have people that um, are qualified to be able to handle mental health things that do come up at camp or have access to them as well. Um, because things do happen. And right now, um, with all the transitions, we're going to see that mental health is even more vital to have, you know, access to um, mental health professionals as we transition because this year, the, the, the amount of abuse that's gone on with kids and the amount of trauma and the amount of unhealthy coping that's happening with kids is really increased. So one other thing to, to um, I'm talking too fast, just say slow down, Lisa. <laughs> one other thing that um, is really important is, you know, when you as staff leaders start to feel that it's going negative to really front load at the beginning, it's really important that we stay positive. If you have a negative thought going on, switch it up because if you think, oh, we can't do this, we can't do it, what happens? We can't do it. But if you can switch it up and say, yes, we can do this, we will succeed, we will have a good year, you know, because we have to have that, that inner critic put away. We don't need that. We need to keep positive and, and just, you know, kind of breathe in God's light and move towards we can do this, you know, keeping it positive. You know, if you feel like you're going to fail a test, your chances are higher. But if I mean, if you study, but if you if you don't study, if you really do um, focus in on the positive, you're going to feel so much, you know, better. So keeping it positive, that's a really important thing for mental health. The other thing is to have a zero tolerance on gossiping, um, even role playing it, because you're getting kids in there and they're, you know, kids have gotten into bad habits and they do gossip and it's very painful. You know, one thing my daughter, Madison, when she worked at camp, um, she told me, she shared with me a story, but she was in the bathroom and she heard two people come in the bathroom. They were leaders. One was leader, one was a camp staff, and they were talking about her. And she said, Mom, I sat in the bathroom and I just prayed and I prayed for wisdom because what they were saying was unkind. And there were students, there were other um, campers coming in there. She was, Mom, I just prayed and I just said, she said, I walked out and I looked at them. They looked at me and I walked out and then she, you know, in time called me and talked to me about it. But that was a really painful thing to her. So that's what I remind her, honey, you are a daughter of the king and we are going to get hits, but we got to stay focused on, you know, you were staying focused on working with kids and helping them stay focused on that. So really having a zero tolerance for um, gossiping and say that at the beginning. Also a zero tolerance for, you know, put downs, you know, bullying and harassment of any type. When I was helping lead Pathfinders, when the kids would do a put down, because, you know, they get kind of goofy and they do put downs. And I'm like, okay, when you do a put down, Zach, you're going to do five put ups. Now let's practice put ups, you know, and some of them, they get all riled up about it and they get really silly about it, but it shifted the environment. Or when I was with a group of kids and they were using words that were inappropriate, I said to them, guys, these words are so old school. Cannot you, can you please just say something like broccoli or asparagus or whatever? And I said, I'm just tired of the, you know, whatever these naughty words, you know, change it up. And it did, it shifted the whole, they would kind of mock me and say, oh, broccoli or, oh, you know, whatever. They just got really silly with it. But we, we can shift that by having a zero policy of these kind of behaviors and um, which make it, you know, safer for all kids. I also would teach people that I work with that we are all hostesses. What that means is when wherever we go, I would tell my kids, okay, we're going to church. We don't know these people. We've never been to this church, but this is God's house and we're hostesses. So we would go in and we would greet people. We would talk like we knew them all. And um, it really changed their viewpoint of like, instead of sitting back and like, oh, no one's talking to us. Oh, no, no. Don't, this is God's house. This is God's camp. We have a job to be the hostesses. So if every single one of our staff members feel that they're, a, you know, a hostess, when someone comes in the, you know, comes into camp, we all greet them. We all clean up when there's something on the ground. We all, if a tray falls on the ground, we help. We don't mock. You know, we, we comfort each other. I know this can be hard for some of the introverts, but really encouraging them to get out of, you know, 
get out of that um, uncomfortableness and move towards being a hostess because it's so what, what really happens when you do that is you have this sense of belonging and it feels good to be part of this community this part of that you know that light sharing that torch with these campers and so you know one of the things i always tell to the, the camp big lake kids or um, staff i'm like you are going to make an impact you're going to have over a thousand kids come through here this summer. You are going to touch their lives and impact them so greatly. You know, you are superstars. So know that being a superstar is pretty awesome, you know, and so that hostess, that superstar, you know, empowering them to be those lights and be those torches. Okay, one of the things that we're finding is people do not really know how to take care of themselves, you know, how to cope you know, really healthy, um, or even how to self-soothe, I'll call it. Um, so we really need to teach healthy ways. And I say, you know, each person needs to have a toolbox that they have personally to take care of themselves. Staff need to have a toolbox, how to handle stress. Because, you know, how people have been handling stress this last year, you know, I'm not sure. You know, a lot of them has been, have been gaming, a lot of them have been, you know, on the internet, doing whatever they can to try to survive. And it's really probably not been really healthy. And so there hasn't been as much physical activity. So, and I call it like self-soothing. We want to teach them. Some kids will self-soothe how their parents are. And, you know, our um, camp is often a mission. And so we have kids from all denominations coming there. And so they might not have learned how to self-soothe really healthy, healthy. So, you know, teaching, you know, even role playing. So how are you guys going to handle when a camper is angry? How are you going to handle when you're angry? We've done role playing like that. And that's really been beneficial at camp to be able to role play even when someone's in pain, how to handle it. Do we laugh when someone falls down and gets hurt? Or do we like, oh, come on, let me help you. Um, how do we handle <laughs> when other people have feelings, um, a lot of feelings? One of the things that I found consistently over the last few years, unfortunately, is you know, our, our staff, um, like the devil is out to really destroy good things. Okay. There's no question. And our staff coping mechanisms have not necessarily been healthy. So I've gone in and I've talked to them at different times about, you know, however you're coping, you know, I know I have heard that, you know, a lot of them are gaming. Okay. So you game, 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 one push of the button or two and and what else is there? They have gaming, they're using up a lot of adrenaline, right? They're getting a lot of adrenaline. They're not using up uh, uh, um, the adrenaline, but they're getting it because it's fighting and whatever. One, they've got a lot of stress. One button or two button over is pornography. So then they get hooked on not only gaming, but on pornography. And I hate to say it, it's not just a male thing anymore. It is a female problem as well. I, I um, Last year, I visited one of the universities, one of our at universities, and a group of girls had heard that I was coming. So they asked if they could meet with me. And these were girls that were leaders at this university. And they shared with me their struggles with pornography. And they asked ways that they could cope and, and process and work through things because they had so much shame and so much grief. So we kid ourselves when we think it's just a male problem or you know, it is, it's, it's across the board at this point because of the access to the internet and the temptation is so great. So we need to teach our youth, our staff tools on how to self-soothe healthy. And they need to have that personal um, toolbox. One of the things in long, uh, along with that is um, boundaries, you know, teaching people, you know, that it's okay to say no, protecting their personal space, limiting time sometimes with specific people or a specific you know, computer, you know, boundaries are super important and, and we need to talk about boundaries. We only have so many emotional dollars a day and what gives us emotional dollars? Time with Jesus and I'm gonna go over a whole bunch of things, you know, but um, if we're around people that are taking those emotional dollars because of the choices they're making, we need to reevaluate that and really have some strong boundaries. And so, and also our campers are going to need boundaries. We're going to need boundaries with them. So kind of discussing with your team, what kind of boundaries do we need? What kind of boundaries do we need in the camp? What kind of boundaries do we need with each other? 
um, it's really important to talk about it because if you don't talk about it, you won't have something set up. And I know you have things automatically set up, but this year with COVID, there's going to be different boundaries even more. Um, and so one of the things I always say is your bunk is your private sanctuary and it's nobody else's. It's yours. It's not to share. It's not to share lice. You know, you need to have that your space. And so even for, you know, staff members too, this is their space. It's private. It's their sanctuary. They need to keep it safe. Okay, so one of the things is we're really good at entertaining ourselves kind of to death. We're not allowing ourselves to have those bored moments or those quiet moments, but we really need to, as staff, allow times, allow those pockets of time to reflect, to pray, to nap, to connect. That quiet time is really important. At Big Lake Youth Camp, um, in the past, we've had social work interns and I've supervised them. And that has been an awesome thing to have. And if we don't have that, we try to have someone assigned to staff wellness. And with that on our, um, in our property there, we have a couple of locations where you can go and have your quiet time where there are boundaries where campers don't go in. And um, one is a place where there's hot drinks and you know pillows and it's cozy and comfortable. And another one is um, we have a, like a little art studio where they can go and listen to music or play music or do artwork and it's quiet time and it's kind of in the forest. And that's been a really blessed big blessing. Last year we had a, or the year before, I guess, we had an, um, someone at PUC who was studying art therapy and I um, supervised her and, you know, gave her some skills and some activities to do. And it was awesome because the staff would come in there when they're having a difficulty. Now she wasn't a trained counselor, but she was someone there to help, you know, and support. And she could turn to me at any time because I was available. So um, in toolboxes, okay. We each have our toolbox, things that make us feel good. Quiet time, play, exercise, eating healthy, drinking water is really important at camp. Kids don't drink water, they get headaches, they end up at the nurse's station because they don't feel good. Um, so staff really staying hydrated too. You know, doing random acts of kindness make us feel better and receiving that kindness is really good. You know, a, a good group hug where you're all around, it, you know, and you move in together and, oh, you know, that's the end of camp for that night. That feels really good. You know, making sure that you have time off. Reading could be good. Being active. Um, every person has to identify their own toolbox. Getting support, making sure you get sleep and rest and prayer. Really important. My, my toolbox, oh, actually... Also, nature, time in nature is really important um, to have in your toolbox. My daughter, Josie, and, you know, she is, she worked at camp a few years. One of the things that she would do, she, music was her way to deal with stress. And if she was sad, I knew it because she would get her violin and she would just <laughs> really hard. And I'm like, whoa, she'd go out back and would do that. But it, it actually relieved her stress. And then baking, um, finding quiet place, soaking in the sun, that was hers. Um, a way to self-soothe or, you know, feel better. Each staff member should be given a journal, you know, a North American division journal, you know, because they can fill it with their toolbox, their ideas. It becomes a way when you write things down, it's so important because it actually lowers anxiety. You sleep better when you journal before you go to bed. And you also can write letters to God you know, in your journal, you can share your dreams, you can process pain, you record things you, that you learn, and you keep track of, you know, things that amazing people have said, and also can help you later in life to go back in that journal and say, hey, my camp journal, wow, look at these things I did, look at the feelings I had towards God, look at this Bible verse, I mean, it's just something really beautiful to add, um, so I recommend that, um, and in 2015, some of you might know I lost my daughter Maddie to a tragic accident. She was 20 and she was a camp kid. Um, so her death and uh, affected me greatly and my daughter Josie. I mean, it just was devastating. We were at camp um, the, the summer afterwards working. And my one of the things that my daughter 
you know, had gotten permission to do from her, you know, Les Silbrook, her leader, was to be able to go and have a quiet time when she felt that she needed it. And so one day she said, mom, can you come with me? And so I went down with her and along the lake, there was this mossy area and it's like a thick moss and you lay on there, it's like a bed, you know, and we laid there side by side holding hands. And, you know, she shared with me that this is where she comes when she needs to cry, where she comes when she needs to mourn and to talk to God. She also shared that this place here, sometimes, you know, it was so beautiful that she cried because of the joy and for thankfulness because of how beautiful it was. And so the fact that her leader gave her permission to do that, knowing that she had this, this deep sadness, that is what she needed in that time. And, and that was so priceless. You know, she knew what her heart limits were. And we need to create an environment where our, our staff can say what they need and that we can help provide that, you know, as best as we can. Um, so that quiet place, place also to get warm drinks, you know, maybe have a question and answer box, you know, like that, you know, leaders could answer if they're, you know, really busy. You can say, hey guys, if you have any questions, put it in this box and I'll go through them in the morning or once a week, however you want to do it. And I said that random acts of kindness. Um, but one of the things that's really kind of fun at Big Lake is if when you bring your laundry to camp, you write a thank you note to the laundry girl or boy. And um, then they're all on the wall. And then the laundry person writes you back a letter. But my daughter was, Maddie was the laundry girl her first year at camp. And she had pasted all over the wall, all the wonderful things that people had written to her why she was doing the laundry. And you know, that's like the bottom job, but to her, it was like the best job because she loved being able to connect with all those people and taking care of them. So being blooming where you're at, teaching each staff member to bloom where you're at, no matter what your job is, just bloom, just really, you know, feel it in. So one of the mental health things that happens um, at camp is anxiety because everyone's really busy. And if you know anything about anxiety, it's like your foot is on the gas pedal and your nervous system has so much stored anxiety going up, so much stored adrenaline. And it brings up a lot of unpleasant symptoms, you know, maybe heart rate, panic feeling and all kinds of stuff. And you've all, you know, we've all probably experienced anxiety and when, when you have adrenaline going through your body, what are you supposed to do? Run, move, walk, you know, use it up. But if you're, in, but if you're not able to do that, it, it turns into anxiety and it can turn into panic. And one of the things we're finding because kids are gaming and their anxiety is going, you know, really intense and probably getting seasick by my movement. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, it just gets stored in there and so what happens is is something will happen that's not that stressful but it will trigger all their stored up anxiety and so you'd be like what just happened with that staff member they had so much energy and you know it's because they've stored up so much of that past adrenaline in their amygdala and their hippocampus and it just came flying out of nowhere and so when we feel that adrenaline we need to move we need to get it through that anxiety. Don't store it up. You know, the other thing is, is after you get it off learning, getting out, learning ways to relax. You know, like one of the things I love about camp, because, you know, everybody's kind of nervous when they come to campfire at night. They're sticking around. They're looking around, wondering what the expectations are. Those, camp, those, those songs that we do are so good for using up adrenaline and moving the stress through our body. It's so good. And then they'll sleep better. So the more of those movement songs you do better do at night are really good, really good. Um, so I, I love that. <clears throat> so um, one of the things also is, you know, timing too. So if a staff member has anxiety, the stretching, standing on one foot actually helps move your thought process. So anxiety is in the hippocampus and amygdala, and it just gets worse and worse unless you use it up, right? But um, if the person can't, like, exercise or move up that adrenaline through, the thing to do is to get your brain, you know, thoughts in another area. And so if you're standing on one foot, you're trying to keep from falling over, right? I'm standing on one foot right now. You guys should all be standing on one foot too, you know? And then you stand on the other foot. Cause then it's like, I'm trying to keep from falling over. And then you do these stretches. 
I'm standing on one foot, you can't tell, but it actually really does help start to relax you and make you feel a little bit better. Um, another thing is to, you know, I always say breathing in God when we're feeling that stress, just and knowing that God is there and he's going to work through this with us, you know, a lot of deep breathing. And that really helps too. And, and, and staff are going to be scared at first when they get up front, as you know, because we've all been done that first thing and you'll have new staff, but knowing, you know what, let's stretch it out. Let's stand on one foot. We're going to do this positive thought. And it just that encouragement really does help with staff and it helps lower that anxiety. And Another thing is just even shaking the hands. That kind of helps you. Or if you think of what's comforted you in the past and five things that you can see, hear, smell um, right now, it kind of changes your brain. And some, some when I'm working at um, the Red Cross, they'll actually have a quiet room and they'll even have one of those heat, um, weighted blankets in there because, you know, staff are working so hard, they just need to really chill and they'll have a weighted blanket in there because that's supposed to give you comfort. They'll also have like cinnamon and peppermint because that changes it out of your anxiety too. So, you know, having that maybe at the nurse's station so that if um, someone is having a panic attack or having an anxiety attack, being able to, you know, do that. Walking, I said, tea, you know, um, positive affirmations. You're going to get through this. I'm going to help you. Um, that's why this toolbox is important because, you know, Anxiety can be very scary. Now, if you have an intense um, anxiety reaction, they also have, um, let's see if, a, um, trying to see if I can get it really, I'm gonna send you this, another way that I'll send it to you, Tracy, and it, it talks about, you know, different ways to help lower anxiety. I'm gonna send that to you, so um, I won't go over all of that. Um, Balance for me to be healthy in my, my mind, body, and soul is every morning I have to take, in my toolbox, I take time with God every morning, or I, I try to every morning. And so, um, and also throughout the day, I'll just say, okay, God, take a deep breath. Um, this patient's going to be really hard. I need you to be there with me, helping me, giving me wisdom. I also do 50 push-ups a day. That sounds kind of crazy, but that was the, my personal goal. I'm like, okay, physically, I'm going to do 50 push-ups a day. So they're girl push-ups, which is still really good. And, um, but it helps me, you know, first I could only do 12, but it was something physical that I knew, you know what, I'm going to do those 50. Oh, I haven't done them yet. I'm in bed. Oh, get out of bed, do those 50. And it just um, helps, gives me balance. Um, I also try to eat really healthy and kind of avoid the sweets. I do have a sweet tooth, so I, I do at times have sweets, but um, I, I try to be healthy. Um, my Sabbaths are super duper important. Um, and if we can make Sabbaths incredibly beautiful, it, it, I can't explain to you how important Sabbaths have been. I mean, you probably know because you have your own Sabbaths, but um, when I think about my life with my kids and I think of, I had a thousand and seven Sabbaths with Maddie. It's going to make me cry. So that was time set aside, time to connect with God, with nature, with family and a community of believers. I can look back and say, you know what? We had so many beautiful Sabbaths to that, together. Those Sabbaths were so special, and there were times where we climbed mountains, where we went on hikes, where we walked in rivers. They just have so many memories. And Sabbath wasn't a time where, like, oh, it's Sabbath. No, it was a time of, like, healing, a time of being together, of connecting, of eating. And so if we can create that at camp, you know, it's, it, it's just a beautiful experience. And that, for some people, that might be their only time they've ever had a week, a day of rest. And so, and so many people are, you know, haven't had that rest time. So um, when you can sense that staff are feeling stressed and feeling overwhelmed, one activity to do is to have them go on an awe walk. And, you know, all of our camps have these amazing places that are like, oh, they're just so beautiful. So if you can walk to this place that's really beautiful, you know, as a, together, Try to walk quietly and you get them out together and you just say, I want you to look at the trees. Look at 
the grass. Look at that beautiful flower over there. Look at that canopy of trees and the insects on the bark or on the ground. Look at the wind, how it moves on the grass and in the trees. Look at how beautiful God has created this area for us. And if you even want to lay on the ground and listen to God's sounds in the air and breathe in that fresh air and then have everybody journal about that. But, you know, you can do that in a, you know, a long, lay, you know, laid out way when you look around and see these beautiful places. That is something that really can calm staff down and it also helps them really be present with where they at, are at instead of like where what's happening next week or what happened in the past. You know, because we when we're in camp, we want to stay have our brains there and be soaking in that and the gifts that God has given us there. Uh, you know, I am always telling my patients, I said, you know, we've gotten so busy that we walk by things that are glorious. I want you to stop and everything that you see that is glorious, just thank God for it. You know, that sunset, oh, it's so glorious. That kid's laughter, oh, that's so beautiful. I love it. Oh, that flower is incredible, or the way the water sits. Stop and soak in the glory. If you do that, you'll find your body just starts to relax. And it's like you can almost feel, I mean, I, at times I feel God's presence. I'm like, man, this is so beautiful. I'll never forget um, the first Friday after we dedicated the camp, the year after Maddie died, we had just dedicated the camp and we went out because the sunset was so incredibly beautiful. And we went out there as a staff and we're kind of all, you know, have our arms around each other and we're watching as the sun goes down. And we actually were watching and weeping because it was like the most beautiful, glorious thing. And we were praising God for that. And so when you have those God moments, you know, individually or as a group, stop take the time to feel him because he is there. It's just, we get so busy that we, we don't connect. And when we connect, our anxiety goes down and it feels so much better. Um, you know, because our time on this earth is like a vapor. It's very short. And so anytime we can soak that in, it's super important. One other activity is when, if you go indoors into your lodge and you kind of stand inside there, you know, one thing you can say, you know, as a group, you're in a circle. I want you to look inside, look around this building. Think of all the people that passed through these walls, all the meals that have been prepared, those that built the building, donated the money, had the hammers, all the people that have come through here cleaning. And, you know, team, you belong here. This is your time. God gave you this time. You know, lives are going to be changed because of you, because we're here. Hearts are going to be given to Jesus because we're here. You know, let's just breathe in those fruits of the Spirit. This is all part of God's master plan for us to be here and to share and to grow. And it's just pretty amazing um, when we do that, how our staff become a team. They know that this is about something bigger. It's not just about me wanting to go to camp and learn how to do this and that or meet a nice boy. You know, no, it's about actually being there and soaking in and part of, being part of a big, bigger calling. So do you guys have any questions for me? I have another segment that I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond if you wanted to. And I'm putting my headphones back on. Yeah, there's only 27 of us on here. You could just open your mic and ask a question or drop something in the chat either way. Hello, this is Pastor Moody, Southwestern Union. In your presentation earlier, I heard you talk about how you work with the staff and some of them deal with addictions to gaming. And then you said it moved over to, um, it moved over to pornography, I think, uh, porn. I think those are good points, but I've been doing some research and I just want to see if you cross this, cross-reference this, that gaming also has the potential 
normal games, not the ones that they're playing that's causing them, you know, to kill and shoot people. But I've noted with mental health, some people have used gaming as a coping skill. Have you ran into any of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just trying to balance and make sure, you know, yeah. that I'm not just reading one side of the fence. Yeah. The thing about it is, you know, you want your brain to be affected in all areas, not just, you know, the gaming area. If you're doing violent gaming, then that area where there's more violence is going to mm -hmm. be stronger. And so you're mm -hmm. going to be triggered more. And so um, there are things that, you know, they actually suggest that elderly people do certain types of gaming that, you know, mm -hmm. have their mind be more stimulated because it does mm -hmm. help, you know, prevent Alzheimer's down the road. And so, um, but being outside is the best bet, but if you can't be outside and there, you know, there's, you have good limits and good parent safety. I mean, I think as a, a church, maybe having classes on internet safety and how to even install the safety on your computers would really be ideal. And making sure that that's in all of our schools and all of our places, that pornography and anything regarding sexuality that is inappropriate not be, you know, loud or violent. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else have any questions? If not, I think we can move on, uh, Lisa. Perfect. Tracy, this is just to uh, have everybody laugh. Uh, Elder Bill Wood said, go, Lisa, with girl power with your push-ups. So carry on. I just thought okay. that was a loud. <laughs> I, I have right. one question. How do you, uh, what suggestions do you give to those that are not not used to journaling? That can be a kind of a hard thing to get into if you haven't done it. If as a leader, if you can um, maybe say, you know, just give them different activities to journal on, like tell me about um, what made you come to camp, write it down or draw a picture. Sometimes um, drawing a picture can help too, having access to different pins so, you know, they can draw really pretty pictures. And I know it is sometimes a stretch, but anytime we learn something new, it's a, it can be a stretch. Um, and so encouraging that some people, what they'll do is they'll write down Bible verses and then like write, do their own translation of the Bible verse and then write about that, or they'll do a, write their prayers in a journal because it's easier, easier, easier for them and it holds them accountable to pray at night. So they'll write the, in their journal, their prayer. So, um, or their prayer list or, you know, a song, their favorite song, write their favorite song down. So you can give them different ideas on um, how to journal and that helps. I hope I answered your question. That, that was good. One of the blessings is my daughter, when my daughters were really little, they couldn't even really, they couldn't write, but they could do um, scribbling. I gave them each journals and I said, you know, mommy wants you to learn how to talk to, you know, to Jesus. And if you can tell him how you feel um, or draw pictures of how you feel, you know, that will help you feel better in your life. And so when my daughter passed away, I have 14 of her journals and they're priceless, you know, they're priceless. And so I'm so thankful that they used that to be able to help them in their life. And it became part of their um, healing in their toolbox. I like what you said earlier on Bloom where you're at. Could you open that up a little bit more? Sure. Um, I thought that was, I thought that thought that was awesome. Yeah. Well, no matter where God puts us, it's a gift, you know, whether it's, I know it, it sounds crazy, but maybe you're up and your job is to clean the manure. Well, you clean the manure because then you get to ride a horse later, you know? So if you can really think of like the positive things about what your job is and the gifts you're giving people, like, I, I said to the cook at Big Lake, I said, you know, besides me, you've been the person who's cooked the most. 
because I've been to camp every summer for my kids. I'm like, thank you. That was such an honor, you know, for you to do that. And, and then later I saw he wrote a post about that because when he heard that, he's like, oh, I am making a difference. And he had been blooming where he was planted. Whether you're cutting up onions, you know, yep, you're feeding people. You're making people happy, you know. And so really encouraging them to find the beautiful things about the job and, and that this is where you're supposed to be right now. You know, and yes, it could be changed tomorrow, but wherever you're at, do your best, your complete best, soak it in, you know, learn something from it. Lisa, this is Jeff. It's good to see you. And uh, by the way, those that are on, she was at my event a few years ago and helped us out. And we really appreciated her. Um, a lot of us are going to be dealing with COVID again and could be dealing with different types of restrictions across the country, depending on um, what we have to deal with in our states and so forth and, and where this thing ultimately goes. Um, what I found last year with, with one of the camps that ran is, is we dealt with a lot of staff that had, you talked about anxiety, they had significant anxiety. We dealt with staff that had um, just a, almost a sense of loss in, in life in general. Do, do you have any um, suggestions on how to deal with staff on where they're coming from with, with the COVID issues that we've all had to deal with? I think one of the things that's been super hard is there's been so much loss. You know, I was, people weren't able to graduate. They weren't able to have the weddings they planned. They weren't able to go to the camps that they wanted to. And we need to honor those losses and say, yeah, this hurts. And this is a really a painful time right now because we're meant to be together and we're meant to do these things. And when we don't have those rituals, it, it creates a lot of pain for people. And then there's been so many unknowns. And I do have, um, later in, in my lecture, I do have um, some more you know, suggestions about that. But um, I think if we can put into play, maybe kind of doing some specific exercises that help reduce anxiety, you know, even every day after worship, in the morning when staff come, okay, guys, we're going to do this. That might really help. And then at night when you do that, that ending thing, doing the little thing then might help too. So um, feel free to contact me and I can help you come up with something. Be more than happy to do that. Yeah. It's, it's, the unknowns are really difficult for people and the loss that's gone, gone along with this. I mean, we're gonna have, there's been so much grief because of losing grandparents, losing loved ones, um, all the changes, not being able to be with your class, not being able to do a senior class trip, so many losses. And I think it's really important to, to talk about those losses and they're just as valid, whether it's, you know, I didn't get to go see my grandma you know, and I always see her every summer, but I haven't been able to see her now for a year. So and that really, you know, hurts. So even getting together as a group and talk about the losses that you've had and that, um, and ways that you've coped with them, I think would be really good because there ha it has been an incredible season of loss. Thanks, Jeff. Good. Lisa, hi. Hi. This is Sam. I'm a, a support personnel at Glacier View Ranch. I got here a little late. Don't know if I if I missed it, but have you guys talked about breath work at all? I I have talked a little bit about you know breathing. Um, and I breathe and I do a prayer when I breathe. Um, and um, so I can talk some more on that though too. Yeah, that that one's been a big one for me. And first, I want to say. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I really want to honor. This is, uh, yeah, uh, been a camp counselor for many years, and I see, see, you know, in the trenches how it affects people. So I really value the work that you're doing. And I'm really sorry about your daughter. I, I see the, the pain and also the, the, the joy, the way you overcome that. I really, yeah, I think it's, it's beautiful, and I want to honor that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So should I go into some, um, Tracy, if, 
unless anyone has, I can have more questions at the end, but I'd like to be able to continue on with a few other things that of course will come up at camp, particularly this year. Yeah, let's go forward. Okay. So one of the things that we're finding is a lot of kids are having insomnia because uh, on their phones, they're not doing the, putting the blue light on at night. And so what happens to your brain when you don't have the blue light or when you look at your phone at night, it resets your circadian rhythm and it messes you up. You will not get all the levels of sleep that you need and it will not be a good thing. And at night, you need the levels of sleep because it cleans out the toxins in your brain and it helps you function better and, and concentrate better. And so please, if, if your campers or staff have their phone, you know, what, if they can put it on blue light at night or have some kind of, you know, set guidelines for it, because what happens with kids now is they have their phone by the bed. Okay, and it might be beeping and might be going off and it's waking other people up, right? And also, if every time they, they go and they get on it, if they don't have the blue light, it's like it's waking them up and they're not getting that level of sleep. So really, you know, have a talk about that with staff. I talked to, um, my husband's an eye doctor, but I talked to another eye doctor who said he's seeing so many problems with eyes because of that and because of, you know, and neurologically issues because kids are not sleeping through the night and it's creating, you know, we're going to have a lifetime of problems unless we really address that as a culture. So, and, and I know for insomnia, I know you guys um, know some of these things, but I'm just going to rattle them on so you can just keep them in your mind. And if we can go over this with staff too, because, you know, some teens, you'll be surprised your staff sometimes don't know some of this stuff. So of course the phone, blue light, don't eat late. You know, make your bed, that sanctuary, that safe place where no one else, you know, has access to, you know, allow yourself some time to unwind, you know, and of course the caffeine, knock it off so you don't have it, you know, there in your system when you're trying to go to bed. Um, another thing is at camp um, this, this year, you know, I was just talking before I met with you guys to a school counselor and she said, Lisa, the amount of sexual abuse coming through, you know, in their Christian school is really sexual abuse is really high right now. And also domestic violence with kids being at home. Um, the other schools in the area are saying the same thing. And so we had to be prepared for kids to disclose. And so having a really good system of what we're going to do um, to be able to handle those disclosures. Um, you know, one in three um, girls is sexually molested, one in four boys. And, and our and um, one in five girls when she is in college is sexually assaulted. So the reality is we're gonna have a lot of wounded people, you know, at our camps. And so being prepared on how to handle that and how to deal with that is cr critical. You know, one of the things I, I was in contact with Tracy's wife a lot when she um, worked in the Oregon Conference because every summer um, we would have two to five kids that would disclose sexual abuse not staff, but um, our kids. And so being able to then, you know, I developed a um, incident form that was based off of Oregon State, what they require for reporting. So every state has a different requirement. So find out what your require, your state has, it will save you so much time. So what we did is we had the form developed based off of um, what Oregon required. Um, for mandatory reporting. And then, um, so if it was a camp counselor that got, you know, the kid um, disclosed to, she would write down the information, hand it over to the director, or if there was a social work intern, and they would contact me, I would review it with them. And then they would pass it on to the Oregon conference and do the report. We had it where we could fax it in. So the law is wherever the um, abuse took place, that is where the report is sent to. So you have to be able to have access to Lynn County or whatever county the uh, crime took place in. And so that's just one of the questions that we had on that. You know, can you tell me where this happened? You're not a forensic interviewer, but you have to be able to cross the dots to be able to make the appropriate legal thing. And us doing that saved us a whole lot of, you know, trouble down the road because it gave our staff a map and we did that training at the beginning so they all knew, okay, here's the form. If this happens, this is what we do. Step one, step two, step three. That was really nice to have. Um, and again, you know, um, yeah, very nice to have. 
Um, also depression, you know, depression is really on the rise. Um, and one of the things to ask is um, even ask staff, you know, if, if a staff member is feeling depressed, I see that as a medical problem. And, you know, we, it's a good thing to know, like if staff are on medication, you know, and because if they're not taking their medication, they're going to feel they can, it's really life threatening sometimes if you're on antidepressants and you stop taking your medication because you forgot. So I think connecting up with the nurse is really important um, and um, reviewing that. Also, you know, can, staff can have um, access to telemedicine now because people are doing telemedicine all over. And so being able to connect them with um, providers would be a good idea if you had that option. Sometimes the depression could actually be grief. And so then the person would actually just need some quiet place, some quiet time um, to be able to process and work through that. Another thing is, is it's what we're finding is everyone's vitamin D level is really, really low. And one of the reasons why is um, high fructose, which is in a lot of the products, actually um, does not allow vitamin D to absorb. So when we're low on vitamin D, we get depressed. So if you go to your refrigerator and you look at your ketchup bottle and you see, oh, high fructose, you're, you know, I can, you know, your vitamin D level is probably low. So vitamin D, low vitamin D level equals depression. You know, throughout the world, most um, high fructose has been banned, but not in the USA. So, you know, check your camp cupboards, see what you're doing, see what you're feeding, you know, people. Of course, I already went over hydration. It's really important for mental health too. Um, very important. So it would be good if you could have staff trained in um, mental health first aid, because then um, if there, it's something you can do online. Um, and I know that like the Washington, different conferences up in the Northwest have been having their staff go through that. And that's been really helpful. So if you can get on, um, have maybe two or three people on your camp trained in mental health first aid, if you don't have access to a social worker, that would be really good because then when someone is, let's say, suicidal, they can assess the risk and get them the help that they need, you know. Um, with, with, with someone who is feeling suicidal or feeling very depressed, it's really important to listen in a non-judgmental um, fashion and to give reassurance and information that you're going to get them help, that you don't want them to suffer and then to be able to have ways to connect them to resources. So, you know, you assess the situation and um, listen, give them reassurance, and then encourage that you're gonna get them help. They don't need to carry this burden. A lot of times people say, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. You know, no, I am gonna worry about it because I need you to live. You know, I'm not gonna tolerate that because I want you to live. So I'm going to get you help. And we've had, I think last, two summers ago, because we didn't do last summer, but like two summers ago, I think we had two kids that were suicidal during camp. And so, and of course we couldn't get a hold of their parent, one of them, even though we, we tried and tried, eventually we did. But, um, you know, it's, we had to really have someone on with them one-on-one -on -one who was trained. And so being aware that these kind of situations are gonna happen. Throughout America, one in five Americans is mentally ill. So I'm giving you some statistics that are kind of staggering. Um, but, you know, one of the things, encourage self-help, encourage people to get support. Um, and that exercise, that toolbox, get that in there. You know, and that relaxation um, can help too. There's all those things in the toolbox help people feel better. And so there's different, there's a wide range of mental illnesses. And um, one of the things we've also seen at camp on the rise is eating disorders. And, um, you know, anorexia is an, a mental health disorder with the highest mortality rate. And so if you see uh, as a staff members it, or a staff member, if this happens, if you see someone not eating, you know, eating disorder people love to come to camp because they, no one's watching them and they don't have to eat. So if you see someone doing that, you say, you know, at camp, it's a time to eat and to be playful and you don't have to be perfect here. And it's, it's, it's healthy to eat and have fun. So I want you to eat your food. You get to eat, you know, and we had a camper two years ago who refused to eat at all. We ended up having to call her parent because, you know, two, three days, you just can't function. And so um, we also had, I had a situation where a staff member 
all she would eat was celery. That was it. And she ended up having to be hospitalized, you know, because one thing that happens is you've got the fat in your brain too. And as you lose the body fat, you also lose the fat in your brain and you can't think clearly. And so, you know, it was so important to get her help. Um, another thing that we're faced with in particularly in the States where uh, marijuana is legal is um, teachers are being given gifts of candy and they're edibles and they're not something that are edible really. But um, so being aware that we probably need to have some guidelines about things that are being brought into camp in the States where, you know, marijuana is legal. The, the, the wrappers look like legitimate candy from a regular candy store, I'm told. And so being aware of that and like, okay, we need to be coming up with some plans because we don't need that in our camps. We don't need kids first, you know, experience with pot to be at Big Lake or to be at Leona Meadows or whatever camp. So um, another thing I found is energy drinks. Um, you need to have a policy about them not being able to bring energy drinks or teas and stuff. There's a new energy drink. Well, it's not so new. It's a few years old um, called Krantom and um, K-R-A. T O M and it's a T and it's actually it's similar to an opiate drug and it's highly addictive. Not a good thing, but you would you can buy it in the 7-Eleven or the market. So um, it's not illegal at this point. It, it's coming in from overseas. So these are things that you know we have to be aware of and to really have some strong um, regulations and rules about that to keep everybody safe. So I, I just say a zero tolerance to certain types of things. You know, we just can't have that. And, and um, yes, if a staff member comes in and they've got addiction, then we deal with it and we deal with it based on whatever policies you have, but in a loving and caring way. So, um, so leadership is really, you know, intense, you know, and so you guys, you're right there. You're in the front lines. You're the ones doing the work. And so that teamwork, that support that you can give each other and that hope and, you know, working with these kids, is pretty important. It's, it's, you know, it's amazing work. So, okay. Some of the things that will help is to have an intake um, where you don't only ask health questions, but mental health questions too, with a checkoff sheet, with a medication history, with a counseling history. I don't know if you've noticed that the nurses are handing out more and more and more medications. Uh, those are because there's more and more kids with mental illnesses uh, or because, or, uh, how do I say this? Uh, we've kind of come to a place in society that we want kids to act a certain way, so we're medicating them. And that, that doesn't feel good to me, and I'm kind of opposed to that, but I see that at camp when the nurses walk around and they've got these huge containers full of tons of medications. I, as, as a staff member, want to know why are they prescribed this huge amount of medication? What has happened, you know, that's created that? And, and if we can review those forms in advance, it's so helpful because then we know, okay, we're going to have this one, this one cabin is going to have eight ADHD kids. Is that really what we want that one cabin to have? We need to be able to evaluate that so that our staff um, can be safe and have, you know, adequate um, help. I even say when, when our campus are coming in to, you have your nurse there, have your social worker or your mental health person there if you can, you know, we get all of our, our nurses volunteered. Why not get social workers volunteered that we get on our games so that they can sit next to them and they can greet the campers and, and um, have, be the point of contact for those campers. Um, and also if um, when the kids initially go in the camp, I know they kind of go over rules and regulations, which is kind of cool. Um, and can be a good time too for everyone to understand the expectations. I say it's kind of cool because I, before I did this, I was actually reading one of my um, daughter's journals and I went back to her camp time. And she, um, when she was a counselor for the RAD group, she, you know, went over all the, she had her journal opened and she wrote down um, the different rules for going out in RAD. And then she had everybody sign in her journal that was there that agreed to those rules. And, you know, and then they talked about it. But that was a really good way for holding everybody accountable. 
So, you know, like no put downs, lots of put ups, kindness, zero bullying. Um, it's important to say, you know, camp's not for dating, you know, so camp's not a dating opportunity. It's for you to have fun and for you to experience amazing things. And, and also for staff to monitor the talk because it's really important to keep it on a level that we're comfortable as Christians. And so, um, at, and then no bunk sharing. You know, one of the things that has happened more recently is people as they come out or they're, you know, trying to figure out who they are sexuality with their sexuality, it can affect, you know, cabins. And then it makes some members of the cabin really uncomfortable. And so teaching um, really the staff that it's okay to say, you know, we're not, you're 12, you're not dating. You, we don't, we're not going to even, you know, go through, go over that. You're here to have fun. You're learning how, you're here to ride horses, you know, and I know that this is kind of fun to talk about, but, you know, let's, let's just keep that off the table. So we can set an expectation for that. And that's really important. Um, one thing I've noticed is at night when the, the physical activities are happening, the capture the flag, those are a good time to have floating staff members that go around and connect maybe with the loners. And um, when, when staff are talking to the kids that are more on the fringe, you know, it's, I would encourage staff to keep it about today. Like, oh, what did you do today? What was really cool? Instead of like, so tell me about your life. Because our staff are not trained as counselors. They're trained as camp counselors. So let's keep it about camp. Let's keep it about the, where they're here and now. Instead of like, oh, you know. Tell me about why you have that scar and what happened. You know, we need to keep it um, about camp, not about things that are deep. Um, yeah, if that comes up, then we take care of it. But um, we want it to come up with appropriate people, not um, people that are not trained. Also at campfire, be aware that um, the topics can really trigger kids. And so if, if you have the staff there that can handle some of those triggers, fine. At be aware that the place that we put on and how we're really there to present Jesus and um, and forgiveness and healing. And so I've been at, at different camps where things are brought up and the camp was, everyone was crying and there was a lot of, I mean, tears can be really good. And I, and I want to honor tears, but also if we're going to talk about sexual abuse as a play, we need to be have staff there because you're going to have disclosures, period. So you need to make sure that your plays um, have adequate, um, we need to review them and make sure that they're going to be appropriate for everybody. Um, one thing also is transitions are hard for parents and kids. And so having a staff available for parents, you know, like that is the parent liaison or the kid liaison when, when kids are dropped off. Transition times can be hard when there's mental illness or, or um, can be hard on staff too, but hard on parents. And when we've had parents blow up, it's usually when there's a transition time and they're not getting their needs met. So, you know, as a social worker, being able to go and say, oh, here, let me help you. That sounds really hard. I'm sorry that that happened. How can I help you? How can we make that you feel better? You know, having someone there because really the director shouldn't have to deal with that. They've got enough going on. But if we have someone who's trained and who, you know, instead of, um, you know, there's ways to interact with people. If you're, in a, if you're interacting like this, you know, you're telling them uh, something. But if you're like, please tell me, you know, it, it's your, if your body language, my hair's a mess. Sorry, I can see myself. <laughs> if, my, if our body language is open and loving and caring, they can feel that. And so having people that are really trained in that will help with the transitions and being a parent liaison. Um, people have been really isolated this year. So one of the things I have really encouraged everybody is to every day reach out to five people and to, and at camp, you know, on that first night, you know, if you're finding that people are, you know, more quiet and because they haven't interacted socially or they might be completely out of control, but being able to give them permission to, you know, you know, what, let's each try to reach out to five people that we don't know today. Maybe say, hi, how are you doing? So, and that's a good thing to brainstorm with the team too, because there's a lot of loneliness and sometimes loneliness is even in the crowd. And so being able to pick that out. So a few weeks ago, I was watching BBC on my phone and a uh, Dr. Radha Mogil came up with um, some seeds to help 
you know, go through what we're up against. And I've added on some more seeds to this, but I wanted to share them. So right now, the seed, you know, like we have, we can figure out what we control. We can wear a mask. We can stand six feet away from each other. There's so much that's out of control, but there are things that we can do and we can wash our hands and then you can set up whatever else in camp, you know, to have control of. We can also be care. We can give, we need to take care of ourselves and exercise, eat healthy and sleep. We need, we need consistency in our life right now. So keeping a schedule, you know, when you go to bed, when you get up, that kind of consistency. If you're used to calling grandma on Wednesday night, keep that going. We're, they're also finding that creativity right now is super duper important um, because it's working a different area of your brain. And so learning something new, doing something different, trying different jobs maybe, you know, would be really good um, so that you have opportunities to have that creative side of your brain working. Also calm, um, having prayer time, quiet time, noise free time and peaceful moments. Um, I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago and the lady who said, she said like put in comedy too, because keep a song in your heart with laughter, hope and silliness because we need comedy. I added in um, connections. We need that connection with our church family, with clubs, community or zoom community, you know, and loved ones. And then I put changes. Change is going to happen. Embrace the change instead of fighting it because we can't do anything about it right now. Learn to go with the flow and, Kind of breathe that in because a lot is out of control and you got to thank God when there's storms, the storms are there for a reason and um, just helps if we can move through the changing landscape. Um, and then the other C, I think you guys can guess probably Christ is Christ keeping him in the center, center of your heart, your, your day, your family, your marriage, your life crucial and conquer. We're going to conquer this, you know, as Christians, we have a map. We know the destination. You know, after I lost my daughter, Maddie, I could not get enough of like reading about the time of the end when I was going to see her again. And it was kind of like I was in my mind, you know, I had to read about heaven. It was like, I wanted to know what was next. Now I've been reading this my whole life, but it had a different flavor to it. It's kind of like I'm preparing for this trip and I'm looking at pictures and I'm dreaming and I'm moving towards it. It's so important. And we're going to conquer this. We are going to succeed, you know, because God succeeded. So one of the things that has really helped me in my life and in grief um, that was so healing is this, this sign of love. I'm going to share it with you guys. So when you've lost someone, there's a look that people give you. And I believe it's the look that Jesus gives us. It's a look of complete compassion, of love, of a deep understanding. And I would go to church and I would see that look. And that look would like, give me a second breath. That look was healing. That look felt good. And then I thought to myself, why don't we give this look to everybody all the time? Why don't we share that look, that feeling? I mean, it's such a gift. Why don't we? And so I thought, of, well, what can we do? Um, that really shows that compassion. And I, I, um, I'm going to stand up so I can show you. One of the things I came up with is for me is like, when I have that deep compassion, I go like this. I look at you and I go like this. The sign for me, when I see someone that's hurting, I look at him and I just go like this, you know, I care. I touch my heart. I look them in the eye, my hands across my chest and I'm tapping um, it's like, if we could show that at camp, that this is how we can care. Like, I see you fall. I care. I'm so sorry. It could even be a skit at the first night to show how we can show gra gratitude and thankfulness. Or if I see you drop that tray, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Or I see you crying and you're way across the way and I can't get to you, but they can see my body. You know, just teach that sign of love. And I don't know if you want to do that, but to me that, you know, I'm giving you guys this because this is hard work and you got, it's beautiful work and it's life-changing work. And I want to honor you with your work and what you're doing. So thank you. I'm giving you that sign. That's it. So okay, have that torch. We're going to have a torch this year.
Thank you, uh, Lisa, for sharing that. And I want to, again, open it up for questions. You've talked about a lot of items here uh, this second half, and uh, some can sc scan back through the chat to be reminded. But any questions uh, from anybody you'd like to share or have uh, Dr. Lisa expand? We've got about another 15 minutes before we're done here. Okay. I, I wanted to share one other thing, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, when you're doing God's work, a lot of times, you know, hard things happen. And so really covering each other in prayer is really vital. Um, the day that my daughter was killed, um, I don't know if you know Dr. Um, Terry Amon, but she has um, been working on a book for non avidness about Ellen G. White. And she had started working on it and her mother got gravely ill and she had to put it aside and she had to do other things. She buried her mom. The, she, the day she started, um, she took her computer out and she started to type. She got a call, she heard the sirens and it was Maddie. That was the second day she tried to work on it. She, you know, after her mom had died. So literally, her fingers, she goes, I just was laying my fingers on the computer. And then I hear, I get the call about Maddie. And Terry and Maddie were very close because Maddie had dated her, um, Dr. Amon, because Maddie had dated her son. So um, Terry and I, you know, had been friends and we talked a lot about this. And she said, Lisa, you really need to copy Maddie's um, journals. There's 14 of them. Maddie had talked a lot to God in him. So I'm like, okay, we set up a time. I get in the car, half a mile from my house, I'm T-boned on my way to meet with Terry. My car is totaled. I, you know, I'm like, Terry, I call her and tell her about this. We set up another time. We um, go, we're together. I get a call, my husband has fallen off a cliff and he's broken his nose and his mouth's all bloody. Second time we're meeting. So I go to the hospital, I'm at the hospital. Third time I go to meet um, a little girl that was living with us, Emma, she had gotten somehow poisoned hemlock in her eye and, and she didn't know if she'd get it in her face. So she's in the ER. So then this is the third time I'm trying to work on Maddie's stuff. Terry and I, are, I'm going to the ER. So I'm like, okay, Lord. So um, Madison had taken a class from um, Pastor Troy Fitzgerald. And I called Troy and I said, hey, Troy, do you have the um, information that Maddie turned into you? Because you won't believe it, my computer was stolen. I don't have it anymore. He goes, but we can meet and we can talk about it. Let's time, let's plan a time to meet, you know. And he gave me a date. So, um, at that point, I called the Dib Dolls, and they came and they prayed with us. And they prayed over our house. I don't know if you know the Dib Dolls. He's a professor at Wally University, a pastor, a lovely man. And they prayed over our house. And I was like, thank you, Lord. And I, I, we felt a sense of relief. So um, I get ready to call up Troy, and then he has a stroke. And... Um, it was pretty devastating. So I decided I wasn't going to talk to him about it because I, I just, I was like, oh, this is really scary for me. So I, I, I prayed and prayed. I said, God, you know, I know I'm supposed to do something with Maddie's writings because her words to God are so amazing and her story of her death are so amazing. And there's no doubt this was part of your master plan. So I, um, my husband goes to Hawaii every year for a training and I would go with him and I would start working on it there, you know, and then the screen would die. Like, okay, what's the deal? So um, last time I went and worked on it and um, I took two computers and they both died. I took it to Microsoft afterwards. I'm like, what is the deal? He goes, I've never seen anything like this, never. So, um, Three weeks ago, I went and I finished the first draft of the book. And it's, it's about her story. And then um, the second part of the book is for youth and 
people. It's, it's um, how she worshiped. She had, you know, she had different Bible verses and she'd study them and then she'd do her thoughts. And so it kind of outweighs that. And um, I, I hope to be able to share that with people soon. But my point is we can't give up. We've got to keep moving forward because time on this earth is short and bad things are going to get, happen, but we have to keep moving forward. Yeah, I could have stopped. I could have stopped many times, but I'm not going to stop because until I see heaven and see Jesus, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to be knocked down. Bad things are going to happen, but we have to keep focused on the eye and what is next and what is beautiful. And, you know, I, my hardest times, sometimes what I would just, when, after I lost my daughter and I was feeling the lowest, I remember walking outside and saying, God, thank you for the dirt today. And thank you for the air today. And thank you for the air that's going in my nose. And I just started thanking him for every single thing. And all of a sudden I was like, <sighs> I started feeling better. The more I thanked him, the better I felt. Mm -hmm. So thank him in the storms. You know, it's her, Maddie's story is not over. My story is not over. Your camp stories are not over. So blessings to you and your work. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Hey, uh, just a couple of comments and we're going to wrap up here. And then if some of you want to stay on and have a little bit of Q&A uh, as we finish out, um, we can stay on for a little bit. But I um, want to ask you, uh, Lisa, I know that you've been involved in helping universities and camps set up internships, specifically in the area of social work, um, social sciences. And um, is there um, a way that if some camps are thinking they'd like to get something set up with this, that they can contact you or you can speak into what the pieces are that need to be put in place to make that happen? Um, or how do we get assistance in that from different camps at different universities? Do you want to just speak briefly to that? Kind of give us uh, maybe in five minutes kind of the pieces that need to be in place. Absolutely. Um, what we first did is we identified um, staff members that were social workers or studying to be social workers or psychology majors. And I, we talked, would you like to do an internship here at camp? So then we started developing internships around that because you probably have some amazing, you know, staff members that are already in school to be social workers. If that's the case, I could work with um, their university that they're going to, or, you know, we can connect up to whatever university you're closest with that has social work programs um, or art therapy programs or healing kind of programs. And um, I, I have done the supervision on that and whatever is required, I, I did that and I made myself available and I would meet with them ahead of time. And now with Zoom, we can do, you know, trainings really easily. This wasn't something a few years ago that we even used. Um, I would go down to camp or I would be on the phone with them. But um, that's something if you're interested and in, I encourage you to find because it's so nice to have, you know, that availability. It's just, it's more hands and hearts to help. Excellent. Thanks. I'm just wondering how, how she can make this uh, program available uh, to the other universities if she hasn't already. Uh, some way to connect with them to, to share what they're doing at Walla Walla and how that can be applied at like Southern here at, at, in Tennessee. I'm more than happy to um, talk with the Southern Social Work Department and see what um, they would like to do or what they, you know, if they'd be interested in that. I think it'd be great to have a social work, um, you know, kind of protocol set up in camps so that that could be an option. Because, uh, you know, what a great way to learn how to be a, you know, social worker. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we've got just about five minutes left. One other thing I think, uh, Lisa, that would be really good to share, um, and I know I didn't front load this with you, but um, just talk briefly about Abba's Child Camp. Sure. And can you share just, you know, five minutes about that Absolutely. and how that works? Um, because there may be some camps that have never heard of that and how, how that could be developed out. Perfect. Um, Monty Torkelson helped develop Abbott's Child a few years ago, and um, then he left, and then we have continued it on. But this year, he actually has developed um, programming, or we're actually developing programming to be able to take it to other camps. 
and um, he is located in Colorado now. But um, with Abba's Child, we take a group of kids that have lost loved ones, and we're there for a week, and we teach them, you know, how to heal. You know, we have activities where we talk about the grief, and we process it, and we um, let them, you know, interact with other kids that have had loss. It is actually very powerful, and um, it's so healing for the kids. And it gives them, some of them, you know, the loss might be recently or it might have been a while ago. And, you know, we just have two professionals, two social workers that help them. And they meet with um, the, the the kids meet with us in the mornings. And then in the, the rest of the time, they do everything whatever else their cabin is doing. Usually it's a separate cabin, um, but they might have other campers in that cabin. So they, they will interact and integrate with everybody else. But in the morning, their, their um, camp time is with us and um, doing activities that are particularly in helping heal um, loss and grief. It's pretty yeah. amazing. We have two camps at Big Lake and Myvedin is gonna be doing some camps too, I think this year too. So I'm really excited to be able to work with you guys there, so. Yeah. I see Jeff has put something in the chat as well about August the child camp. And so, um, yeah, the contact person is uh, Elder Monty Torkelson, and we can get more information shared for those that may be interested in that. Yeah, we really want to get this out to a lot of camps because it's really when kids are suffering and they, they don't have to suffer, they can get help and know that they're not alone. That's so healing. So reach out to Monty. Well, I want to close out with prayer today, and I'm going to ask uh, Bill if you would close us out with prayer, and then after that, um, Kiefer has some announcements uh, for our next um, series, and then uh, we can stay on for a little bit, those of you that might want to stay on for a bit. Bill. Yeah. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, wow, this has been an awesome presentation by Lisa, and uh, so much has been learned. If I were still like, running a camp, I would pull tons of information out of this seminar apply it to the camp is we know that the mental health issues that we're facing today are crucial to the survival of our young people and even families and staff members. And I pray that the camp directors on this uh, will take what they've learned and apply it to their own camps that this coming summer for those that still are running uh, camps that uh, they can apply them to, to the staff and and uh, build it into the training program that during the summer, uh, all those that are utilizing the camp, the campers, the staff, the uh, others that come on site will benefit from what Lisa has presented to us today. And most of all, Lord, may it benefit the young people that uh, as they attend the camps, uh, they'll see Jesus in the lives of, of the, young, the staff that work at camp because they have the right connection with Jesus themselves mentally. I pray that you'll bless our camp program, that uh, as our camp directors plan for the summer, that you will guide and direct in everything that takes place. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.